Hello everyone and welcome to module 7. This week our focus is going to be on the geriatric side of patients. Uh, so last week we learned about pediatrics. This week we're going to learn about the opposite end of the spectrum here and that's going to be geriatrics. So for this week we are focusing on two chapters. Chapter 41 and that's going to be actually all of chapter 41 and chapter 56 only pages 1328 to 1329. So let's go ahead and get into these two chapters and break them down a little bit for you guys. Okay? So starting with chapter 41, we are talking about assisting with the lifespan uh, specialties. So geriatrics, obviously. Working with and providing care for the elderly population requires specific considerations. You need to consider ways to support their physical and emotional needs. One way this can be done is through effective communication. Proper and effective communication with the geriatric population centers around calm, relaxed, and respectful interactions. So with that being said, there are four key things that you need to keep in mind when you're communicating with geriatric patients. First and foremost, do not be hurried. Rushing through will pose a risk for errors, but will, it will also send a message of unimportance to your patient. You want to speak clearly and slowly. You want to make sure that you are clear and to the point with what you're saying, and you want to speak slowly so that you, you don't throw them off with being rushed. Again, not rushing through that speech, but also, you want to go, you don't want to go so slow that you actually end up giving them uh, offense or you come off offensive. Number two or three, you want to make eye contact. So many geriatric patients will consider eye contact a form of respect and confidence. But really that's with any patient. You want to make eye contact with them to get that connection. And lastly, the big one, avoid using any pet names. It is really one of the most irritating and annoying interactions to people of all ages. So avoid, you know, calling people sweetie or hun or dear. It's really not appropriate and you really shouldn't be doing it in any specialty, but ex specifically that of geriatrics. They find that very offensive. So next topic uh, for this chapter is talking about the process of aging. And the aging process is a continual progress starting from birth to the end of your life, which is death. It's important to know that there are factors that impact how a body goes through the aging process, um, including lifestyle choices, occupational hazards, nutritional choices, their ability to seek health care services, and their physical and social environment. One other thing that we really need to pay attention to is a term called ageism. Now that refers to a prejudice against and an incorrect assumption about individuals or an individual because of their age. Awareness to the aging process will help to increase the respect and empathy the elderly patient receives and deserves. So with the aging process, um, there are a couple of sets of, of changes that happen. Those changes could be physical or the changes could be mental. Physical changes of aging relate to each and every body system. So your integumentary system, your nervous system, your, your digestive system, every single system in your body will go through some sort of physical change. Now, when you're rooming an elderly patient or an older patient, you must document accordingly and report your observations to the physician for immediate evaluation. The, system you, the systems you will be able to notice physically change could be that, again, of your integumentary system, nervous system, maybe the sensory system, musculoskeletal system, and their respiratory system. 
but not every single system will you be able to see with the naked eye and see the physical changes. Some that you may not be able to see are that of your urin their urinary, digestive, cardiovascular, endocrine, and reproductive systems. Now, like I said, there's not only physical changes, but there's also mental changes that a patient will go through with their aging process. Mental deterioration is not a normal part of aging, contrary to what people believe. So I think that's a big thing to stop and talk about because everyone assumes that when you get older, you start to lose your memory or your, your mind just goes away. That's actually not what is supposed to happen. Yes, there are mental you know, health issues and yes, there are mental changes, but it really is not part of that aging process. <clears throat> Mental health is the ability to cope effectively with life changes, manage life stresses, and achieve a state of emotional balance. Now, in order to find good mental health, individuals must partake in activities that they find interesting and engage in regular social interactions. If they don't do those things, they are more likely to have mental health conditions later in their aging process. There are a few areas that we as medical assistants and medical professionals really do need to pay attention to. For instance, we need to pay attention to cognitive ability. This is the ability to think clearly, reason, and perceive. Normal aging does not reduce any cognitive ability. But memory does fall under this category, and memory can be short-term or long-term, as well as sensory. <clears throat> and many things can really affect your memory, but the biggest one that we have to pay attention to is medication. For example, if a patient is given the wrong amount of medication, or is given a medication at the wrong time, or maybe it's skipped altogether, that can cause a big problem on their mental abilities. Next thing we need to pay attention to is confusion. So this is a term that physicians and healthcare professionals use to indicate that a person cannot follow a conversation, cannot answer questions appropriately, and cannot understand where he or she is. They also cannot remember any important facts or make safe judgments. And again, confusion could be acute or chronic. So it could be due to a medication as well. We also have to be cautious of the fact that patients can have depression. It's defined as an abnormal, abnormal or persistent mood characterized by sadness, melancholy, slow mental process, and changes in eating or sleeping habits. Medical depression is confirmed if five of these symptoms have been present daily for at least two weeks. Depression is often overlooked in elderly or misdiagnosed as part of another problem, such as dementia or Alzheimer's. But it's important that if you suspect a patient could be depressed, you bring that up to your doctor immediately. Now, the other thing that we need to pay attention to is dementia and Alzheimer's. They are two mental changes that can occur. But I'm not going to go into them as you discussed them previously in your clinical skills one quarter. So if you need to, please look back at your book for chapter 41 on what dementia and Alzheimer's are. Now the last thing that I want to talk about for chapter 41 is going to be elderly abuse. Abuse of elderly by family members or caregivers may occur at the home or in institutions and has many forms. Things such as stealing patients' belongings, inflicting injury or harm, or even pain, mishandling monetary funds, withholding care such as food, drink, medications, or even taking them to the restroom. It could be sexual abuse or threatening or confining a patient. Now, as a medical assistant, you must be alert to all signs and symptoms of abuse, and all cases of suspected or known abuse must be reported. 
And as you can see in the picture here, only one in six cases of elderly abuse are reported. So if you, if you assume it, if you think it, or if you know it, you need to immediately report it. It has to be turned in. That's the only way we can get elderly abuse to stop. All right, guys, that is going to wrap up Chapter 41. I want to take just a few minutes and talk about Chapter 56, uh, which is focusing on teaching older patients. So it's important that their intellectual capacity, and we know that their intellectual capacity usually does not diminish. It just merely changes. So some changes that take place as a person ages are a slower mental or slower processing time. With that, it typically helps to break material down into smaller units. Take time to really explain each item on the list to, to your elderly patients and don't skip anything. They also have decreased short-term memory. So the older patient will often have an easier time remembering what happened to them in, in the past, but really struggle with remembering newly acquired information. And this can absolutely make the process of patient education very frustrating, not only for you, but for them. New information should be linked to a well-known past experience when you possibly can. They also have decreased dexterity and mobility. This can be because of arthritis or other physical changes. But elderly patients are not as physically able to do the same th things that they could when they were younger. With that, we have some durable medical equipment, or DME, that may often be used, such as walkers, canes, wheelchairs, shower chairs, or even oxygen. And the last thing we need to pay attention to is that of the fact that they have increased anxiety about new information. So as the as the advocate for your patient, you can help them by encouraging and building their confidence level with new material. Practice positive reinforcement and provide encouragement when displayed, when displaying an understanding of a new concept. That helps it to stick a little bit better in their minds, but also make them feel better about what they're learning and what they're doing. All right, guys, that is going to wrap up Chapter 41 and Chapter 56, pages 1328 to 1329. The only other thing I have left to talk about is your homework assignment for this week. Um, so you have one case study that will be due Sunday, August 20th by midnight. And what it is, is you are writing about the CMA National Exam Preparation. So throughout your education, you've been preparing yourself for the CMA exam, and you are actually very close to taking it now. So what you need to do is in your paper, in your APA formatted paper, you need to answer a couple of questions. Number one, how does good critical thinking apply to your goals of becoming a certified medical assistant? And number two, you plan to review your course textbooks tests, as well as purchase a CMA review book, hopefully. Um, but you also are thinking about setting up a study schedule and set up a study group. So with that, you need to A, develop a simple study schedule that you can follow and prepare for your exam. B, how much time do you think you should allow for studying before taking your exam? C, what criteria should you use when you're asking people to join your study group. And number and D, you want to research the CMA exam review sources and list two options that you can utilize to help you prepare for this national exam. Again, that will be due Sunday, August 20th by midnight, and it needs to be at least one page in length written in proper APA format. All right, guys, that is all that I have for you. I hope you all have a wonderful Module 7, and I can't wait to see how you guys are going to be studying for this exam. Bye, everybody.